latest on Singapore's reopening plans, the national vaccination rate is not the only factor being considered. Parliament debates two motions on jobs and foreign talent filed by NCMP Leong Man Wai and Finance Minister Lawrence Wong. And a 69-year-old man is convicted of murdering his ex-wife at ITE College Central three years ago. You're watching The Big Story coming to you live from The Straits Times newsroom. I'm Olivia Quay. You can subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. The Health Ministry confirmed today that the KTV COVID-19 cluster was officially closed last Wednesday, September the 8th, after no new cases were added to it since August the 15th. MOH announced a new cluster last night though, 28 cases at Rinse Nursing Home in Bukit Batok, of which 20 are residents and 8 are staff members. Meanwhile, there is ongoing transmission at the Avery Lodge dormitory, which has 58 cases so far. The cluster at DHL has grown to 41, with household contacts of the workers now getting infected. And the Chinatown Complex cluster has 81 cases as at yesterday. COVID-19 also raised in Parliament earlier today. Eighty-one percent of the population are fully vaccinated against COVID-19, but Senior Minister of State for Health, Daniel Puducherry, told Parliament today that our vaccination rate isn't the sole factor determining when Singapore can move from one stage of reopening to the next. He was replying to 19 MPs who asked for updates on the COVID-19 situation and wanted to know more about Singapore's plans regarding vaccination and opening up. I can understand the desire for transparent and predetermined criteria. This is of great interest to all of us. Uh, other than vaccination rates, we need to also consider case numbers, the transmission trajectory, our social behavior in adherence to safe management measures, and the status of the testing regimes. So while we have achieved our vaccination target of 80%, taking all of this into account, we have decided to pause the transition plan given the rising number of cases currently. We're not reversing course, and neither are we charging ahead. With four vaccination centres set to close at the end of this month, Dr Janel also said the number of public health preparedness clinics offering COVID-19 jabs will be increased from the current 79 to around 100 by the end of October. Well, also according to Dr Janel, to date there have been 367 paediatric cases of COVID-19 with 172 infected with the Delta variant. Breaking down the 367 figure, 50 cases were one year old and below, 83 between two and four years old, 76 aged five and six, and 158 cases were seven to 12 years old. Children under 12 account for 0.6% of all local cases. Fortunately, in Singapore, no child thus far has developed severe illness requiring oxygen supplementation or ICU care. So the percentage of infected children that experience severe illness in Singapore is zero. We are, however, mindful that the number of cases in the community is rising. And there may be more children infected with COVID-19 in the future. We will ensure that these children receive appropriate care if their illness is more severe. Well, on to two motions that are taking up the majority of today's sitting. Finance Minister Lawrence Wong said that if Singapore takes a, quote, politically craven approach and impose stringent conditions on companies looking to operate here, the country will lose out on good investments and Singaporeans will be deprived of good jobs and career opportunities. And in a strongly worded statement, Mr Wong hit back at the Progress Singapore Party for the way it's framed its criticism of the government's foreign talent policy. He responded to PSP's claims that freeing up jobs taken up by foreigners here will allow Singaporeans to automatically fill these roles. But that thinking is fatally flawed. Uh, first, we already have more than 25,000 PMET vacancies today, with many companies still looking to hire. With so many companies having difficulties filling these vacancies, how would we find people with the relevant skill sets to take on the additional tens of thousands of jobs that Mr. Leong thinks can be created by getting rid of the foreigners? 
Second, if our policies were to become overly restrictive, companies will just find other places to operate in where they can be more competitive. We would lose all the jobs they brought here. And if we are not careful, decades of hard work to build up our business hub will be wasted. Our economy will contract and go down in a tailspin. We'll end up with far worse problems, and it's not the foreigners, but Singaporeans who will ultimately pay the price. Mr. Wong acknowledged, though, that being an open economy has its own downsides because the rapid pace of any change in any vibrant economy means there will be people displaced from their jobs, but cautioned that the issue is not about foreigners working here. Even if we got rid of tens of thousands of foreigners, locals will continue to be displaced because of technology, because of innovation, because of the changing nature of work over time. With the rise of remote work, people can work from anywhere in the world and they need not be all in the same place. In the face of these pa painful dislocations, it's easy for politicians to blame someone for them. People don't lose jobs because of technology or innovations, they say. But it's because of the foreigners in our midst. They are the reason you have been displaced. And if they can mobilize existing racial prejudices against particular foreign nationalities here, better still. And that's why we see nationalist and protectionist sentiments gaining ground everywhere around the world. That's why populist and anti-immigrant parties, even neo-Nazis and fascists, do well in many European countries. Far easier to point fingers, make one nationality or another the scapegoat and blame them all for our troubles rather than work on reskilling our workers. Mr. Wong also appealed to PSP to refrain from anti foreigner rhetoric that can potentially deepen fault lines between locals and foreigners, as well as between Singaporeans of different races. He said the strong racist and xenophobic undertones in PSP's campaign against SICA or the India Singapore Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement have not gone unnoticed. PSP's stance on SICA was also brought up by Law and Home Affairs Minister K. Shamugam. He pressed PSP's non-constituency MP Leong Man Wai on this in a heated exchange that lasted around an hour. I'm quite confused by the answer. I'm quite confused as well. So may I ask, sir, through you to Mr. Leong, uh, one, just tell us, does he and PSP or do, yeah, does he and does PSP support FTAs? A simple answer will do. Mr. Leong? We support FTAs in general. Thank you. Would that include, sir, the support for SICA? Yes. Uh, in general. Yes. Let's then have that recorded as he and PSP support SICA and FTAs in general. Well, the two motions filed by Mr. Wong and Mr. Leong are still being debated in Parliament, including speeches from the Leader of the Opposition, Preetam Singh, as well as Manpower Minister Tan Si Ling. You can visit straitstimes.com to read more on this debate. Well, moving on, responding to questions about whether the Local Qualifying Salary, or LQS, will be regularly reviewed, Senior Minister of State for Manpower, Zaki Mohammed said there are no plans for now to raise it beyond $1,400. Last month, month, the Manpower Ministry announced that from September next year, firms hiring foreign workers will have to pay all local workers the LQS. The LQS is a stable benchmark that has been in place for many years and it has been revised four times in the last five years. So we recognise that the new LQS requirement in 2022 will have a significant impact on employers. So we are also mindful and sensitive to the fact that many of our companies are still recovering from the effects of COVID-19 on our economy. Hence, we have no plans to further increase the LQS for now, but we'll focus on the implementation of the new LQS rules and also for the other sectoral and occupational progressive wages to establish the relevant wage benchmarks. So I urge members not to look at each measure in isolation, but to bear in mind the overall and holistic impact on not just the workers, but also the employers. 
The LQS increased from $1,000 in 2016 to $1,400 in 2020. Mr Zaki added that there were 103,000 full-time resident employees earning a gross monthly income of below $1,400 last year, about 5.3% of the full-time employed resident workforce. In other news, IMDA has suspended the online citizen's class license after it repeatedly failed to declare all sources of funding. TOC will be required to stop posting content on its website as well as social media channels by 3 p.m. on Thursday. And if the media platform continues to be in breach of the requirements, its class license could be cancelled by September 28th. China's State Councillor and Minister of Foreign Affairs Wang Yi calling on Prime Minister Li Xianlong at the Istana today. PM Li saying afterwards that they had a productive and candid discussion on international and regional developments, adding that Singapore welcomes China's continued contribution in our part of the world and will keep working with China to build a more harmonious and peaceful world. In the High Court today, a man was convicted of murdering his ex-wife at the ITE College Central Campus back in 2018. 69-year-old Seat Che Hung stabbed and slashed Lo Hui Gyok eight times before stabbing himself. The court heard that the couple had divorced and Seat was unhappy with the division of matrimonial assets. He is expected to be sentenced next Wednesday. The Esplanade's total income plunged by $12 million from April 2020 to March this year. The pandemic took a huge bite out of business with sponsorships, donations and rental revenues all declining. While this year will again be challenging, the Esplanade is looking ahead to 2022 with the opening of a new waterfront theatre. And the annual star-studded Met Gala in New York never fails to showcase the most outrageous fashion looks. Not one to disappoint, Kim Kardashian here turned up in head-to-toe black with matching mask and train. Vogue describing the outfit as something new and inventive. But perhaps the most dramatic look came from rapper Lil Nas X, making his debut at the gala in an ornate cape covered in intricate gold beading. He then removed it to reveal a golden suit of armor underneath. And that wasn't all. The 22-year-old revealing his final look, a gold bodysuit covered in crystals. Well, what can I say? Simply show-stopping and I wish I could pull that off. Well, for more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com and of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. I'm Olivia Kui. See you tomorrow on The Big Story.